Hi, I'm John Doyle, the Artistic Director of Classic Stage Company, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Classic Conversations. For some time now, we've been presenting this series of informal chats between myself and artists that I've either worked with or look forward to working with one day. The conversation loosely follows the format of a British radio show called Desert Island Discs. It is my great pleasure to welcome this week's castaway, Tanya Pinkins. Tanya Pinkins, I'm so happy to see you. Good to see you, John. It's been a long time. Well, it's been a long time. You were, yeah, you, we met for a lovely cup of tea down in a little coffee, a tea shop that you took me to in the Lower East Side. And it, it was the first action that I took when I took over a classic stage, was, was meeting you. Oh, wow. Well, I knew that there had been history. And <laughs> a little, I, little history. <laughs> I uh, everybody talked about this history. And I said, well, the first thing I'm going to do is meet Tonya. This is ridiculous. You know, people should speak to each other, which is why I got together with you. And I, I've always felt badly ever since because I've kept thinking we should have been, we should have been meeting more often to talk, I felt. But life goes by. What are you doing in Seoul and Korea, for God's sake? Um... Well, behind me is a virtual background for a film that I wrote and directed and produced called Red Pill. And um, I'm here working with an editor named Minji Kang. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, have you edited a movie before? Shorts. This is my first feature. You know, I've only ever done one feature film. Yeah? Yeah. Did you love it? Oh, I loved it. I loved it, loved it, loved it. I, I had extraordinary, I worked with people like Ellen Burstyn and Colin Firth and Paddy Clarkson and Margot Martindale and bam. And I loved being, I was terrified because I'd never been on a movie set. And I, I, I loved being, uh, Horton Foote wrote it, you know, the great Horton. Yes. And he got in touch with my agent and said, would I direct, the, he saw something I did on Broadway, a little thing that almost nobody saw called uh, Catered Affair. And, okay. and I suddenly got this script, Orton Foote would like you to direct his movie. I said, is he out of his mind? Because like, I don't, I truly had no idea. And he's, and they said, yes. And so I, and then I was asked who I thought, who would I like to play this lady who was 80 years old in it? And I said, well, my favorite American movie star is Ellen Burstyn. You know, mm -hmm. she's Judy Dench for me. So, but she'll never do it because she's never going to have heard of me. And we had a cup of tea in New York City and she said, I'd like to do this. And oh. it was the most wonderful experience. And then and the bit that I loved, two things that I loved about it. Once, one was actually being in the space with the actors. You know, so much, so much of the feedback was, we don't usually see the director. And mm. I loved being in the, in the, by the camera. Wow. And the bit that I truly loved was the editing. Oh yeah. And I never thought I would, Tonya. I just really because I didn't. I thought, oh, this is going to be too scientific for me, and picking out this bit of this, and there's no, there's no naturalism or inspiration, and in that I was totally wrong. Mm -hmm. And you can carve a performance in that editing suite. You can make a whole new movie other than the one that you made in the editing space. It's kind of incredible. And I had only 10 days to shoot this. And I have an amazing cast of theater veterans. I have Ruben Blades and Luba Mason and uh, Deshala Osakalumi and Jake O'Flaherty and Colby Minifee and Kathy Curtin and Kathy Irby. And I didn't have a lot of time because I didn't have a lot of money. So essentially, sometimes I go, look, I'm turning the camera on you. I'm going to just shoot you for the whole thing. We're going to play it like theater. And then you know, trusting that these actors could do what they do. And then I could go into the editing room and craft it into the way I, I wanted it to be. So it's been, it was three months in writing and post and shooting, and it's been almost 10 months in, in post-production. I found some of the post-production tough. I found, yeah. you know, I, 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 and I also then found the distribution stuff really tough. I mean, well, I, I don't even know anything about that. <laughs> so did you, I mean, this is phenomenal. Did you, only you, did you raise the money, put, I mean, the whole thing? Yes. You are extraordinary. <laughs> I did the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, you had a story you wanted to tell. Yep. 
did you try to get other people to do it first or did you just think, no, I need to be the person to do this? Well, it actually was kind of like this. I was sitting at a friend's house in, um, in Chatham, New York, and we were having this conversation about politics. And my, uh, I have just always from my childhood been a person who could see a reality of the world that most people around me did not see. And we were having one of these conversations. It was the weekend after last summer, there were two uh, mass shootings on a Saturday and Sunday, two weekends in a row. Yep. And uh, this friend was just like, oh, so dismissive and it, so random. So those are crazy people. And I found out of my mouth came, you think they're crazy because you can't see that there may be a leader behind them like Hitler who has a vision for a thousand year plan. Yep. And over the next few weeks, this vision of that in our current time came to me. And I started writing this story and I asked that friend if I could shoot at her house because it was like a scary movie house. She was like, I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult, but she <laughs> said yes. And the location, you know, that can be one of the most expensive things. Yeah, so yeah. I had this amazing location and I started trying to come up with uh, log lines and I started pitching them to people. And then a friend of mine who had made a movie for a little bit of money, Harris Doran, um, he said, you, you better write a script. I was like, oh, okay. Cause I started with pictures. Like I'd go on Canva and pull yeah. images and colors and yeah. things like that. And then um, I wrote it and then I hired a production person to write a budget and uh, give me a schedule. And so I paid this person to do that. And they were like, you don't have enough money. You don't have enough time. And I was like, wow. So then I hired another person to look at their budget and they were like, oh, that budget is way too low. And that time is way too low. But I just was like, well, if it's supposed to happen, it's supposed to happen. And then a friend of mine, uh, you know, I started asking people for money and w nobody was willing. It was like the end of the year. And I was trying that if you yeah. give me $10,000, you get that tax right off. And nobody came forward. But one, one friend said, I don't have a million dollars for you, but I know someone who will give you a million dollars worth of advice. And so I ended up meeting this gentleman named Junie Smith, who'd gone to NYU film school almost 30 years ago, and he had made 28 films in 27 years. And he sat down with lunch with me and this other friend, Count Stovall, at the West Bank Cafe. And Junie is just, he's a showman, and he just proceeded to talk to me. And he was like, you're willing to put up your own money? He said, then there's no reason why you can't make a movie. He said, you just have to green light your movie. And you have to remember, you can't pay those union fees, but you are giving people an opportunity. And he was just, he was pitching me on my movie, yeah. And from that, he gave me the confidence to go out there, negotiate deals, find people. And I stopped being in that mode of like, do you like it? Do you like it? It was like, oh, you returned my call? You're interested. You're so interested. can you work with what I have? And this amazing cast came together and we shot a feature in 10 days. Extraordinary. Yeah. When I did the one I did, uh, we had a 20, uh, let me get this. I think it was about a 25 day schedule. Just Luxurious. Luxurious. But I said to them, listen, I can only do this if you let me rehearse. I, I can't, that's mm. all I know how to do. That's all I'm interested in doing, really. So I can't uh, make this movie with these wonderful artists unless I'm in a room with them for a bit of time. And of course, they realized that rehearsing didn't cost them any extra money, right? They could get the rehearsal within the fees. Right. But we rehearsed for 10 days. Nice. And we shot the movie in... 20 or 21 days as opposed to 25. And the, and the producers kept saying, how has this happened? I said, because you gave us the time to use our skills so that when we got on that, in that floor, we didn't have to have those conversations when all the techies are angry that we're taking up time. Yeah. We, you know, and, and every actor said, oh, thank God, this is like the old days. Yes. What it used to be like, you know. So listen, Next time. Well, you, uh, you mentioned sort of, you know, your activism in a sense when you were with your friend. I'm, I'm going to sound like I'm being facetious, but I'm not. Were you, were you born an activist? I mean, was that in the family? It was not in the family. In fact, I would have to say of my family, they were um, um, like kind of purposely head in the sand. Um, but I've been standing up 
for as long as I can remember. I remember I went to stay with a, an aunt in uh, Missouri at, at the Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri Army Base. And, you know, everybody, black, white, it's the 60s. Everybody lived on the same block on the Army Base. And I was there. And all these kids were uh, doing something that I found was inappropriate. I was seven. And um, I, I stopped it. And it, it, it started a kind of race war because then the black kids and the white kids stopped speaking to her, even though I wasn't friends with any of them. I, it wasn't that I wasn't friends with This is wrong. You, you can't do it. And so then they just stopped speaking to each other and to me, but I've just always been that way. And, and obviously at that age, you know, I mean, people talk to me about directing plays and I say, well, look, the first one I did when I was 21 with stars in it, I was completely fearless, right? It was like going down, it was like going down a ski slope. I didn't care, I was great. I deserved to be there. And now I'm scared of going into the rehearsal room, right? As I've got older, I've become more fearful. But you don't seem to have become fearful. You seem to have become, strong. I mean, I didn't know you when you were seven, but, but that very nature of that fearlessness that you obviously had at that age has stayed with you. Has it always stayed with you? Um, I think that I like the feeling of being scared. I don't feel like I'm actually working at the top of my game if I'm not afraid that I can fail at something. I get it. So when it's like, ooh, this, you don't know how to do this. You're going to have to learn. That's exciting to me. <laughs> I, get I, know, I know what that feels like. I was reading your, the, the, the essay that you wrote, which is fantastic. Uh, and, you know, I, I, usually when I have these conversations with somebody, I, I start with like two or three questions and see what happens. In your case, I've got pages of things. I've got <laughs> five hours. So we, have, we, we can't do all that. But okay. I, I, was, I was struck. I was struck by certain words that came across through it all. And, and, and one of the things that you said, and I hope everybody who's watching will go and read the essay in, in Medium, but one of the things you said is about being branded difficult, right? Mm -hmm. uh, did, did you feel that you were branded difficult early? Um. I know it's something that my then agent manager used to always say to me, and it would always sort of, you know, make me hurt a little. It would hurt, yeah. and um, but it would never make me back down. <laughs> no, I understand. It would be like, well, they know I'm difficult, so they should be prepared sure. <laughs> for what that is going to be. <laughs> it's interesting, though, isn't it? I mean, I when I did Sweeney Todd in New York City, right? When we were casting Sweeney Todd in 2005, I was given the pleasure of meeting many actresses to play Mrs. Lovett. Mm. And, you know, I met most of my CD collection in that, at that very time. And they, they sent me out to Portland, Oregon to meet with Patti LuPone. Mm, I love Patti LuPone. I just... Uh. And, but I didn't know her. And so many people had said to me, oh, she's difficult. Watch, she's difficult. And I spoke to Stephen Sondheim and I said, um, what, is this true? I've not met. And he said, no, she's a force. And I said, okay, now I get it. I had, I've worked with Patti twice. And I've never had one second of what I would call difficulty. Challenge, yes. Mutual meeting in a mutual place, absolutely. Difficult, totally not. Do you think that word difficult is put upon women more than men? I absolutely think it's put upon women more than men. And I think as a general rule, I think it's more of a producer rule, word than a creative word. Because I think that as a creative, you want someone who's asking you questions because like when someone finds uh, something they don't understand, then you've got to solve it. And so that's like the, the process of constantly solving. But I think for a producer, difficult is I can't buy them. There's not enough <laughs> Not of money, like it's difficult. I offered them this and they said no. And it's like, yeah, because you don't get to buy my creativity. Like I either want to be in the room or I don't want to be in the room. <laughs> and I'm sure it's difficult for you when you assume that everything's for sale. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And people see difficulty as the other word that people use is trouble. Oh, she's trouble. 
what mm. does that mean? <laughs> I, I've worked with, as you could imagine, many very complex humans in my career. How could you not? I've been doing this for 45 years. And I can't really think of, I mean, I can think of somewhere I've thought, oh, let me out of this for her room and go to bed. Of course, <laughs> of course, we can't all love each other. But I, I've never felt that, I, I mean, there was something else you, you, you said about, wait, let's see if I can just find it in my pages here, but about you, you as a black woman, not so much just not being heard, but that has in the relationship between the director and the actor, particularly around a black character, let's, let's look at that, your point of view, if you like, not being heard, that, mm. that not being a mutual experience. And you beautifully, you beautifully at one point mentioned George C. Wolf as, as an exception to the rule. Do, I mean, if that is the case, if that, if that, which I'm sure it is, are people just not being trained how to be directors? What's going on, Tanya? Well, because I get this opportunity to teach master classes all over the world, and you know, I've been at Yale and UT yeah. Austin and UCT and yeah. USD San Diego. I mean, so I've gotten to sit in the programs and see what's happening. And um, you know, I look at the sort of anglophilia uh, in our in our entertainment in industry. I don't think you can separate it from a kind of anti-blackness. And I think that until America reckons with that, what ends up happening in the universities is I look at my students, and it's like the thing that makes them authentically black, black American, which is its own very specific thing, gets trained out of them. They're asked to, you know, smooth all the edges and make their teachers feel comfortable with them and that they're not going to bring up anything that is going to make them uncomfortable. Consequently, their work is always a little, um, it's a little empty. Yep. And the, the, the Brits don't bring that to America. Um, and then the, the non-American actors get elevated anyway. So it's like, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to tamp you down. Mm -hmm. And then we're still going to elevate someone over you because we have to always remind you that you are the bottom of the caste system in America. You are the mud sill and everything is built on top of you. Yeah. And unless we know we can keep you on a nice leash and yeah. take you around and serve you up to serve all our friends in this kind of neutered um, way, then you're just not going to get certain opportunities. I mean, it, I, I, can't, I can't relate to the depth of that, obviously, because the thing I'm going to talk about is nothing to do with the color of my skin. Uh, so it's, it, it's not, but it was partly to do with who I am. When I went to theater school as a Scot, right? As somebody who comes, you, you've been to Britain, you know. Um, so I walked the West Highland Way. Oh my God, I didn't know that. I was talking to somebody at the weekend about the West Highland Way. Now, isn't that beautiful? Ah. Uh, that was one of, I mean, 100 miles I did in seven days was fantastic. It is fantastic. But you know, we were not allowed to be Scottish. Yeah. The generation we had, when we went to theater school, we, we were no longer allowed to sound like ourselves. We had to sound as if we were, well, what was then called Queen's English. The mm -hmm. Queen, really, what's that got? She's German anyway. What's that got to do with anything, you know? And, and mm -hmm. you're talking, and, and I felt, that I can remember then feeling very confused and actually hurt by that. So the level of hurt that you must be talking about is a hundred times what I'm just relating to. Well, I think that they are very the same. You know, I've read a little bit of the history of what the Brits did to the Irish and the Scots, and, and it's similar, you know, they starved them to death, they scalped them, they did some similar kinds of things. So yeah, yeah, the difference is that you could get the, you could get the language, you could get the posture, you could wear the clothes and you could pass. You know, there's a certain way in which I can't pass because of the color of my skin. Those, you, though many of us do get a kind of honorary white status in our careers. I mean, do you think that your, does your, uh, does, well, we have this in common, so we can talk about this. Does your Tony Award give you that white, that honorary white status? 
Um, I think that I was able to get that honorary white status by one, getting picked to be in Mary Louie Roll Along by Hal yes. Prince and Steve Sondheim. You, well, you, you know, get artist in that show. Was I what? No, Giancarlo Esposito was also in it. Of course, right? So, um, you know, that just opens doors. You can't, I, that opens doors. So uh, that certainly helped. And, and winning a Tony, you know, there's a sort of a, a winner circle. And there's an honoring of, of, of Tony veterans in the theater that I think lasts a lifetime and that people don't get in Hollywood. You're, you're constantly forgotten. But I think the theater really just honors all of its, you know, winner circle people forever. You can always come back. Uh, so definitely it gave me that. Also the fact that, you know, my mother had me taking etiquette and elocution and articulation when I was three years old. So I was constantly being beat up by the black children and it was the white communities that embraced me. So there's this way in which I know how to be and I know how to behave. And yet as I got, and, and as I was growing up in opportunities were not coming my way, I kept wondering, well, what, what, what more can I do? What more can I do? And it wasn't really until I was maybe 29 or 30 that I had my sort of rude awakening of like, oh, it's because I'm black? Because prior to that, I really didn't, really didn't experience much racism or I dismissed it as someone's ignorance. Yes, yes, yes. But, you know, at 29, um, when, I, when I was in this custody case um, with my husband who was white, and for the first time in my life, I literally experienced like the forensic therapist would, would take identical behavior and they would be completely uh, empathic with him about that behavior and they would pathologize identical behavior in me. And I, I didn't, I was just like, my map of the world blew up. I didn't even know how to be because I thought, wait a minute, and nobody's even going to be on my side because black people are going to be like, well, you, 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 you know, you, you married somebody white, so you don't belong to us. And then here I was, you know, with my husband going, she said she could play the Medea. I fear for my life from her. Oh my and it was God. like, and it was like, okay, so she's an angry black woman. Yeah. And I really felt that there was no place for me in the world because I'd never been accepted in the black community or the black theater community. And now here I was being sort of rejected. So it was just this map of the world. And I had to re, I had to re find myself in the world. And I found myself in the world of being um, sort of back as that seven year old on the army base where it's like, Oh, Oh, you thought you could fit in. No, actually you can't. So this world that you see, and there's a whole lot of people who live in it, you at least have some skills that can allow you to enter rooms, but don't ever forget, you are getting to enter somebody else's room and they can kick you out at any time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you gonna read something to me? I am, there's a poem I love Go that on. I'm gonna read to you. I was gonna read an excerpt from my novella, The Angry Fat Black Woman Who Devours the World. Um, which is about this uh, woman who works at this patriarchal university. And on the day that the novel begins, um, her boss says one stupid thing too many, and she literally bites off his head and chews it up and shits it out and says, anybody else? And, <laughs> but in order for you to actually understand what was going on, I was like, that needs a little more than three minutes would allow. So um, this is a poem that I adore and I, I share it with people I adore, and I adore you, John. So um, it is called The Invitation, and it is by Oriah Mountain Dreamer. And it kind of is a, a philosophy for me for how to live. The Invitation. It doesn't interest me what you do for a living. I wanna know what you ache for, and if you dare to dream of meeting your heart's longing. It doesn't interest me how old you are. I want to know if you will risk looking like a fool for love, for your dream, for the adventure of being alive. It doesn't interest me what planets are squaring your moon. I want to know if you have touched the center of your own sorrow, if you have been opened by life's betrayals or have become shriveled and closed from fear of further pain. I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without moving to hide it or fade it or fix it. 
I want to know if you can be with joy, mine or your own, if you can dance with wildness and let the ecstasy fill you to the tips of your fingers and toes without cautioning us to be careful, to be realistic, to remember the limitations of being human. It doesn't interest me if the story you're telling me is true. I want to know if you can disappoint another to be true to yourself. If you can bear the accusation of betrayal and not betray your own soul. If you can be faithless and therefore trustworthy. I want to know if you can see beauty even when it's not pretty every day. And if you can source your own life from its presence. I want to know if you can live with failure, yours and mine, and stand at the edge of the lake and shout to the silver of the full moon, yes. It doesn't interest me to know where you live or how much money you have. I want to know if you can get up after the night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and do what needs to be done to feed the children. It doesn't interest me who you know or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. It doesn't interest me where or what or with whom you have studied. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else fails away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in the empty moments. Absolutely beautiful. And also that wonderful exploration of a sort of human fragility in, 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 in life, you know, like the bad bits are part of the good bits. I mean, yes. there's, there's something holy in that, I think. Yes. Very, yes. very simple. Also the, a word that you used very near the beginning, is, the, is in there right at the beginning about aching. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but in these last six months, for every reason, one's had a deeper sense of aching, probably, than, than certainly than I've had in my whole lifetime, I think. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's not, of course, I mean, you know, here, here we are talking at a time when 200,000 200, Americans have died, you know. I mean, it's, and a million in the world have died. Oh, and I'm, people in America are dying at 800 a day. Just terrifying. Police officers, have, more police officers have died from COVID than have died in the line of duty. It, it, it's unbearable, isn't it, really? It's unbearable. And we're constantly being lied to, aren't we? And that, that was another of the reasons that I needed to get out of the country. That gaslighting uh, threatens my sanity uh, when you can't even uh, have a conversation about reality with people. Then I'm like, okay, I, I just can't do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't do that. I mean, you quote a bit of a, 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 something biblical in your, uh, in your essay about what is it uh, to gain the whole world and lose your soul? I mm -hmm. mean, that's what we're seeing happening. And you know, it's so, the president is only a symptom of the problem, I think. I Absolutely. Mean, he's just the, the pimple that is the symptom of the disease. And, and it's, it's it, I mean, I don't know, as artists, we've got to keep going. We have, we have no choice but to keep going. We but, have to leave away? Yeah. And there's this sculptor, I, I think he was Austrian or German and he sur survived the Holocaust only to die here, um, Egon Lehner. Uh -huh. And he, a quote of his is, the only appropriate response to abuse is creativity. And that has, has led me a long way over the decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, the only appropriate response to abuse is creativity. Creativity. You also say in here, in your essay about, you know, which, which I've, I think in my heart, I've always owned this notion that, that the responsibility lies with the individual, not with the collective. Yes. Uh, and, and how do you, and I agree with that, wholeheartedly agree with that. I, I, you know, like too many committees, America, too many words, America, you know what I'm saying? Like, what is that wonderful thing in My Fair Lady? Words, 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 I'm so sick of words. You know, like, <laughs> really? And you no sooner grab the terminology that you're expected to be speaking and they change it. And then you've got to learn another set of terminology, right? So there's a sort of science behind our communication, which has got a dangerous element to it. But how do you, 
how do you manage that individuality? Um, well, you were saying something. I'm on a tangent before I answer that question. And it was, I was reading Marshall McLuhan, who was famous for the, me the medium is the message. Um, it was his Paris Review interview. And I think sometimes people get that medium is the message thing a little wrong. And what he meant about it is he said, whatever the technology you're using, it actually alters who you are. Your technology alters who you are, as we're seeing with the <clears throat> computer technology and how the algorithm is now feeding us information and knowing what will, will get us upset better than we do. Yes. Um, that it, what he says is that pre, you know, Neolithic man, paleo, pa Paleolithic man lived in a world that was censorial. And I was just uh, watching a documentary about the Kogi people of Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, Aluma is the name of it. It's so powerful to see these people who literally take a child from infancy, raise them in a dark cave till age nine, where they're just in darkness and meditating and staying in connection with the earth. And so what McLuhan was saying is that early man lived in a world where all five senses were equal. And so the world was sights and sounds and everything all blended and they were one with it. And these Kogi people talked about coming out into the light for the first time and that's all they could see was light. There was nothing but light and it took time for them to start distinguishing and separating things. He says, when we, be, when we got language and when we created languages where the symbols for the language stopped relating to real things, we turned the eye into the primary symbol. And then we began to create language that made what we see as if it is reality. And so there's a whole language called E prime, which asks you to remove the verb to be because you don't actually know that anything is anything because of you know the philosophy of phenomenology, which says we are just experiencing things. It's my experience. Your experience is different. To me, that was part of being in New York right now. I'm walking down the street. I'm in a mask. I'm in gloves. There are a lot of people who are behaving exactly as they did pre-COVID. And you know what? It's going to work for them. Yep. They're not going to get sick. They're not going to die. Who's to say their world isn't valid? It's working for them. But I'm not going <laughs> to risk that world. That's right. So, you know, there's, we're living in different worlds. And when we start thinking that ours is the only way, we kind of get in trouble. So I think that, you know, going through this experience of being sort of outcast all the time and, and seeing all these people sort of rally around a point of view and a worldview that completely didn't match mine, I just got used to the fact that I was, you know, probably always going to be walking in worlds that other people were not in. And, you know, I can't unring the bell of knowing what I know. I know. <laughs> I, know I know, I know. I mean, I feel a little of that as a, as a, well, first of all, as a Scotsman then working in England, and they're very different cultures. And then for a long time, I felt like I was living abroad. Now I'm living in America, and I'm really feeling like I'm living abroad. And America in its, is feeling abroad with itself, if that makes sense to you, right? Yes. It's split, so it's feeling, it doesn't know who it is anymore. And my whole ache is to go back to the mountains of Scotland. That's, that's where I, I, I don't know that I want to be there, but that's where my soul wants to be. Mm -hmm. it's, and I keep thinking, stop thinking like that, John. Stay here, stay in the moment, fight the fight. You know, do you know? But it's tough, Sonia, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, it's tough. Um, and yes. don't you get exhausted? Um, I do, but I realize a lot that I get exhausted because I'm interested and I'm curious. And so I'm talking to different people. And so there's a whole lot of things that I know that so many of the people that I associate with don't even know because the world also allows you to curate what you find out about. Yeah. So, you know, when the uprisings happened the week of Memorial Day, that happens to be my birthday week, I was up all night watching just police brutality in New York City online. Like people were posting videos and I'm just watching, I'm just watching violence. And then I would get on the phone and talk to people and I'd be like, they'd be like, how are, I'd say, how are you? And they'd be like, I'm dandy. And I'm like, how can you be dandy? And, and, and it would be like, because they hadn't, they didn't even know what I knew. <laughs> that wow. didn't come in the, their newsfeed. And wow. so, I totally get the fact that we've got 
these people with different, they're diff different worlds. And that in a certain part of our country, they're actually being fed non-realities all day, every day. All day. And that is the only source they have. And so that's their reality. That's right. Now, going back to that business of individualism, I don't mean individualism in a selfish way, but the individual, and that our job individually is to tell the truth. Um, and uh, looking at our profession, right, and wanting, I'm sure, both wanting it to continue and to be healthy in some way and recognizing that there is a huge job that will last longer than our lifetimes to make it healthy, right? It's going to need a lot of artistic doctors to sort this one out. Um, do you... What do you feel about that? You know, and I'm trying, I don't want to ask a question to which I sense I know the answer, but you know, in terms of the groupings that happen and are happening at the moment, in terms of, you know, we see you white America, uh, white, uh, white American theater, uh, which is almost the antithesis of the idea that the individual can make the change, that we, can, we individually take responsibility. Do you think we need both those tensions working together? Absolutely. I totally um, have a, a spiritual philosophical view that the reconciliation of opposites is the truth. And um, someone I admire, and I don't want to out them, said um, they've always believed that um, for Black America, or for, for change to happen anywhere, you need someone who's going to blow up the room, you need someone who's going to infiltrate the room and you need someone to feed the community while the other two things are happening. And so, it, it, you know, you need, you need them both. It doesn't, it doesn't, one is not enough. You got to have, we, we think we're in this polar world, but really they're, they're, they're there. So, you know, we see what started with their collective thing, which is what an amazing beginning. And now they keep branching out and expanding and showing other things. And ultimately for change to happen, the collective has to take action. If all of Amazon went on strike, if all of the healthcare workers went on strike, if all of the essential workers went on strike, okay, yep, we need that. We totally need that. We totally need that. But everybody's always looking for somebody else to be first. So somebody's got to be first. And the bystander effect is like, wasn't someone doing it? And, you know, so and somebody got to go martyr themselves. Yes, and it's two things, isn't it? It's it's systemic. But it's also what happened I mean, in our case, what happens in that rehearsal room? Mm -hmm. What are the conversations in that rehearsal room? I mean, you know, I was very struck by what you said uh, about, um, you know, you have to call it out. The artist, the artist has to call it out. Otherwise, how do you live with yourself if you're not calling it out? Um, and I think that's... I, you know, yeah, and, I, and I, what I didn't get to say in that article, because that article was 20 pages long and it could have been a lot longer, is you're in somebody else's house. Yes. They get to have whatever they want. <laughs> it's their house. Yes. Okay. I want to show where I only got to see beautiful white girls with their legs going up in the air. It's my house. It's my <laughs> money. Okay. So, if, if, you know, if you're not going to come in the room and go, well, I'm not willing to be in your room, even if I fit this thing, unless you bring some other people, they're just going to think you're happy to be in their house too. And you like their house too. <laughs> <laughs> and you like their house the way they want their house to be. Exactly. You're complicit, in that sense, <laughs> complicit. And there was yeah. another word that you used about the American theater. You, you, you talked about Anglophilia there, but you also talked about nostalgic. Mm. Talk to me about that. Well, America is the spin capital of the world. And I was just reading, gosh, Anand, I can't remember Anand's last name because I wouldn't pronounce it right, but he has this blog called The Ink. And, you know, we sold Hollywood to the world. We sold this idea of America to the world. And I have a friend who used to be the Speaker of the House in, uh, in, in, in California. And uh, we were sitting and he's now a big lobbyist. And I was like, isn't America going to rise? I mean, this is the biggest property shift in, you know, since the French Revolution. He was like, no, because Americans believe that they have the highest quality of life in the world. <laughs> and it's like, 
it's all manufactured that we could sell to the world these amazing ideals of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and all men are created equal while actually doing the exact opposite thing, enslaving four million people and saying they were three fifths of a human being. Like we've been schizophrenic from the beginning, but the ideals that we talked about they did allow a whole lot of people to come here and have things that they would have never had in their countries. So I think that, you know, the immigrants who made America coming from the oppression that they were coming from, they came over and they're like, mm, they, okay, I don't care. This is so much better than what I was going through. Uh, yeah. I can jump through all these hoops. But for people who grew up in it and believed in it and believed that America was that thing, I think that's why you've got this apathy and this despair and this opioid addiction because we have this nostalgia for something that never was. Yeah. It never was. Yes. And do you think the American theater has that nostalgia for something it never was? You know, throughout the American theater, there have been some amazing shows and some amazing things that have got in. You know, Ethel Waters wrote a show on Broadway back in the 30s. Oh. Uh, you know, so there's always these little things that peak, that, that peak in. And I think the arts is always the place where the truth can bubble up. And it's just whether it'll get sustained. I think that's why, you know, fascist regimes first want to kill off the artists because artists are always going to be telling the truth even if they cover it with everything you want to hear. <laughs> you, know, you go back and you look at old shows, Oklahoma, they can be revamped now because the people were trying to get at a truth, yeah. but they understood their time, their society, and well, they're not going to hear my truth, but I can dress it up like this. And for them who have ears, they will hear. And you know, you can get this other thing. <clears throat> Absolutely. Do you want to ask me anything? Um, What has been something that was a setback for you that turned out to be the best thing that could have happened? At the time, it felt like a setback. Yeah. And then with some distance, you were like, oh, that was really, sure. that was actually good. <laughs> I, went, I, I went to be the artistic director of a theater in Liverpool in the UK. Uh, in the late, very late 80s, and it was a troubled, deeply troubled city um, at a very troubled time in Great Britain. Uh, as if we're not always in a troubled time, but it was, it was not good. It wasn't so long after the Brixton riots and the Bristol riots. And, um, and I, I went there as a, a, a man who was raised in what we call council house, you know, uh, the projects basically in Great Britain, in, in Scotland. And uh, I was accused of being snobbish and, uh, um, uh, you know, because I spoke nicely, I was accused of being, you know, those like those Southern people, as we would call them in Britain, right? A Londoner, which I was far from. And, and I had five years of of pain in a way, because I found the city extremely painful to, to work in, and uh, I, I didn't find any of it easy. But I think I did my, I think I learned how to be an artist. I think mm. I learned truly how to be a director. I, I learned, I learned that I didn't have to have the answers, I only had to have the questions, and I only had to have the questions to which I did not know the answer. Um, and during that time, I, I thought, I'm going to have to give this up. You know, this is all pointless. And, and really, I should be doing something more meaningful, and I should be a social worker, or whatever I thought I, was, I should have done. It was in my early 40s. And a, a, a colleague said to me, I know it's been hard, but you can, you can do, you know, the stuff that you want to do as a social worker, or the stuff that you want to do as a minister in the church, which I'd considered. Uh, you can actually do in your work. You can do it already. You're already doing it, in fact. You're just not facing the fact that you're already doing it. And I left that city. I've never gone back. I've never wanted to go back. We have a, 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 a television program called Brookside in Great Britain, which is set in Liverpool. I can hear the theme tune. I have to turn the television off. <laughs> I, 
And yet, it, it, it made me who I am. That's the only way I can describe it. So it, it, was, uh, it was many things. It was taking an organization through, uh, you know, the, the organization when I took it over was, went through big court, big cases, big court case for systemic racism, which I'd inherited as a situation. And that's not easy. You know, that change is not easy. But uh, that, that was the key time. And there have been many other times where I thought, oh, I should give this up. There's got to be something more worthwhile. And then I'm reminded that, um, that, that you talked about the individual, but you know, we can change the life of one person in an auditorium that we've never met and are never going to meet. And that's an extraordinary gift, really. I was, I, I was talking to somebody the other day about seeing in London, seeing uh, the production of uh, Nicholas Nickleby, you know, the uh, famous production. And uh, I went to see it and I sat down upstairs by myself and, uh, I, and the lady next to me, I think I was telling Ben Bradley last week, the lady next to me held my hand and we didn't know each other. And I thought the power of theatre is an amazing thing. The power of I think it's a ministry. I think that it is a sacred and holy place for people to come into a dark room and, and share this experience. I think that's uh, And that's when, I, when I reached out and called you, it was after seeing The Color Purple. And I, you know, I have opinions, I have opinions. Sure. And uh, it's one of my favorite books. And I didn't like that movie. And you know, Alice Walker wrote a, a, a memoir about how it nearly killed her, that movie. And then the first production of it, which I had so many talented, amazing friends in it, I was just like, that's not it. And then when I came and saw your color purple, I could see that, um, that seed of someone who recognized the holiness of the theater. And I was like, oh, I, I have to work with this person. Um, and so then I reached out to you because I was like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. This is a person who is, yeah. yeah. I was going to go uh, to be a minister in the church before I went to theatre school, and it's never completely gone away. That's not to say that I haven't struggled with my own sense of religion from time to time, don't get me wrong, and certainly struggled with the uh, structures, with the institutions of the church, but then I struggled with the institutions of the theatre, so it's the same thing. Right. But, the, but the basic help, the, 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 the storytelling need is, is powerful, it's strong. And I'm, I don't know about you, I mean, you're making a movie, thank God. But um, at this time of these months of not being in a rehearsal room, storytelling like that is quite painful. You know, it's quite deeply, it has ache inside it, that there's a sense of loss in that, in that not having that moment where you look in an actor's eyes and you understand each other and you don't have to speak. Yeah. It's the most glorious thing. Do you know what I'm saying? It doesn't yeah, I, I, I always say performing with another fabulous actor is as good as sex. Oh, you know, the, yes. the connection, the back and the forth, it's like, oh, it's just so good. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Listen, we're going to have to stop soon. And, I'm, and I know you have a song for us. And I'm going to let that song be the final thing that happens, if that's all right. All right. All right. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I've oh. got to have you on my podcast. I'll have to interview you on my podcast. Oh, I that. can't say that on the Broadway Podcast Network. So I'll reach out and schedule something. With you. I would absolutely love that. Thank you. Tanya, thank you so, so much. Oh, tell us why you chose the song you've chosen. Um, this song is called Llorona. Um, it uh, is a Spanish folk song. I think people know it from many movies. And um, it is... It's been for about four or five years a song that uh, I feel for my world. Uh, it's the weeping woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's many stories to the Yorona. There's horror stories to Yorona. There's a new political horror movie, but the Yorona, the, the weeping for for my world, the weeping, but the love. There's the love and the weeping and the the combination of those two things. And so it's kind of the only song I like to sing these days is this song. So and we're going to play a recording of me singing it. And you know, uh, there's, there's so much room for the weeping woman, I believe. I mean, you know, thinking back to being Scottish, being Celtic, we weep, right? And we, sang, we sing sad songs, and we sing sad songs to touch our own sadness. Yeah. And the world is so busy trying not to be sad, which seems extraordinary to me in a time of such deep sadness. 
touch through sadness. We have to touch that, that sadness, that ache in our soul so that we can birth the next thing. I always think like that, that piece in the Bible, it came to pass. And if we would just allow things to pass, they keep, they keep passing. You know, it's really good. Well, it's going to be really bad. Enjoy this really good. Perfect. Enjoy this really bad because it's all going to keep passing. Keep passing. God bless you, Tonya. Thank you. Lovely, lovely to see you. We'll enjoy your song. Bye-bye. Oh, this song, I'm going to tell you what it's called. It is an old uh, Mexican folk song. Um, many of you may have heard it in the movie Coco or the movie Frida. It is called uh, Yorona, the weeping woman. And uh, I love it because I think sometimes I want to weep for my world.
I hope you enjoyed that just as much as I did. Our future at Classic Stage is dependent on generosity. So many people have recently donated or sent words of encouragement. If you can help us in any way, please visit our website, classicstage.org. On behalf of all of us at CSC, stay safe.